Good afternoon, everybody, because it's afternoon now. Um, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Um, I, I, the speakers so far, so many insights, um, lots of stuff I'm going to take back to my environment, but also an awful lot of things where I'm going, yes, that is true. I have learnt that, I have done that, I have applied that. Um, so those that are a little bit further behind on the journey, Inspire, this is a really, really good way to pick up some of the key points to take it forward. Um, a little bit about me. I'm Jan Ford. I work at the Ministry of Justice, which is what it says on the slides. Um, one of the things I'm responsible for at the Ministry of Justice is professionalism and capability of our IT workforce. I'm also a member of the Government IT Profession Board, and within that... I'm responsible for driving forward the government's IT graduate programme. So I take the graduates coming out of university and I turn them into future IT leaders in government. A little bit of context about government, because I don't think we've got many people here today who work directly in government. Some of you definitely supply to government. Um, I joined the civil service only five years ago. Before that, I'd done 30 years in private sector, uh, mostly in IT, uh, both here in the UK, but also a lot of work internationally. I can say, totally honestly, and I said this to my new graduate intake on Monday this week, I still come into work every day after five years knowing it's going to be exciting and rewarding. The opportunities I've got working in IT uh, in government are extraordinary because the sheer scale and complexity of the civil service are unique. Um, possibly the American civil service comes close, but it is absolutely extraordinary. I also get the added benefit when I go to work in the morning, I know that what I'm doing is making a difference to our society. And that's a really strong motivator. And it's a very important part of me understanding the IT professional workforce I'm working with, because that motivation is in all of them. Government does everything. We do banking, HMRC. We do mapping, land registry. We provide IT services all over the world. Um, Department for International Development and the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We operate in environments as different as, you know, the elite um, corridors of power of the Cabinet Office to Olympic Games venues. In my home department, we've got an extraordinary set of business processes. Um, we own the Data Protection Act. <laughs> you can hit me all later. Um, <laughs> we also deal with industrial tribunals. So some of the HR issues you're talking about are very close to our core business. Um, and at the more scary end, we've got Cat A prisons with some really scary people in them. On an ongoing basis in the Ministry of Justice, we deal with over 250,000 offenders. And each year, we hear over 4 million court cases and we resolve more than 700,000 disputes. That's an extraordinary scale. Delivering IT to a business that big and that complex is an extraordinary challenge. But as civil servants, we have to, our role is to serve society. And in doing that, we have to be very, very value-driven. Now, I know that's true in the commercial sector. I've been there. That was my previous life. It's even tougher for us now. It's tough for everybody. And we have to do it in a very transparent way, um, which is quite hard work. In the civil service, we are modernising. We are embracing digital. We are committed to radically improving our digital citizen service delivery. So big change agenda, big transformational agenda for us as well. To do this well, we need a high-performing team of IT professionals, and that's why you'll see that in the government ICT capability strategy, um, 
every element of it, Sophia is important. Every single element. The Ammo J CIO is a terrific man called Andy Nelson, um, who's my boss, but he's also the government CIO. Uh, and I know on a daily basis how deeply committed he is personally to this professionalism agenda. Capability strategy addresses the challenge of, and I quote, how government builds a cadre of expertise that continually and sustainably develops to keep up with a rapidly changing technical and commercial environment. Another quote from the strategy. These challenges are not unique to government. Consequently, the strategy that we are implementing is utilising industry standard approaches, most notably skills framework for the information age. We're doing that because, and we've stated it in the strategy, which is available on the Cabinet Office website, Sophia is regularly refreshed to keep abreast of trends in the industry, such as those mentioned above. So it's current, it's real, it's pragmatic, it works. In the strategy, we've committed to a cross-government, profession-wide, common approach. So this is back to why common language matters. Development paths for ICT professionals. Curricula for ICT professionals. Progression standards. Managing talent and resources across departments. Supply and demand. Sourcing training and development. Standards and accreditation. All the same messages. Government-wide, we're embracing this. Now, oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry, chat. There we go. <clears throat> Going more local for a moment, within MOJ, we have um, an applauded transformational programme called Transforming Justice, uh, which we started just before the last general election. And we're motoring through it. Um, Institute for Government and the NAO have audited that programme and it's used as a good example of how to do real business transformation in a government department. It's very ambitious and a lot of components in it absolutely are dependent on IT enablement. Within Modg ICT, the group itself, um, We've done one major transformation programme as we took three separate IT organisations and moved them into each other. Sophia was a key part of that journey because it gave that common language. We, we did hit the issue of when is an architect not an architect, <laughs> but it, it helped that journey towards a common language. It helped us restructure from a people perspective and from an organisational need perspective. We're now starting an even bigger transformation journey, implementing a service tower-based approach to sourcing and management of our suppliers. Um, it's big, it's complicated. We need Sophia again to help us through that journey. That's going to be embracing other parts of the government's ICT strategy, such as PSN for networking and MOJ is taking a lead on some of these things, but it's working very collabor collaboratively with other key government departments, such as DWP, HMRC, Home Office. You're starting to see government IT joining up and it, the government IT professionals joining up to deliver it. It means for us in MOJ that we're going to need yet another IT organisational design. Um, there's bits going out, there's bits coming in, there's levels going up, and all of that, that Sophia model, that approach to um, understanding <coughs> demand and understanding sourcing is really, really important. And we're using that Sophia language and approach, not just for our internal retained workforce, but in our conversations with all parts of the supply chain, which is vital where we're going to have a community of suppliers operating in a tower-based model, we have to have that joined-up, consistent language. But we also have um, a change-weary workforce, and it comes back to the people again. 
<coughs> Change is scary. Um, and when you've done it several times, it's painful. So what we're trying to do is not just look at the organisational needs, but give our people a route through this. So what sort of things... Give them the, the, the anchor points to think about. What sort of skills should they be thinking about developing? What sort of career paths might there be? Will they necessarily be in the MOJ? Um, start getting them thinking differently. Um, and we're starting to get them to think about these future IT technologies. Personally, uh, and I've had some arguments with some of my colleagues in government, I don't think there's anything new that isn't in Sophia. I think some of the language, it's a bit like the web, web comment, some of the language maybe needs modernising, but the essence of what's in there, I think, fits. I haven't found something it doesn't fit yet. We've been running um, a continuous professionalism and capability programme in MHA for several years now. We refresh it every year to match the maturity of the organisation and the need in terms of where we're going on the journey. We're strong on talent management. We, we push it really hard and we push it at all levels of the organisation. Um, we do it against several dimensions, one of which is IT professional skills. We push very hard. We really encourage people to operate as communities. And you can be in more than one community. In fact, if you're a social person, you probably want to be in more than one community. Um, and within that, we encourage people to share their experience and their learning. We offer a, a very wide range of learning approaches, um, partly because money's tight and partly because people learn differently. Um, and within that, we've established a really strong brand called Know How. So anything we're doing has just got that Know How brand on it. Uh, we actively encourage knowledge sharing and we actively encourage celebration of learning. It shouldn't be a chore. <laughs> Underpinning all of that, Sophia IT Professional Skills Reference Model and also the other half of that diagram, that left-hand block on the diagram earlier, we have something called our core competency models in government called Professional Skills for Government. And that's actually something that's going through a refresh at the moment. We signpost all our learning, but we do it with a very light touch against these frameworks. It, don't make it too mechanistic. Don't, don't try and make things absolute that are not absolute. So from my perspective, well, as I said earlier, I've been in this business for a very long time um, and uh, things have moved a long way. Um, I am here with my iPad with its full 32 gig, but I started on our mainframe with 32K memory, with punch cards, manual exec, not even um, an automated operating system at the time. I can code overlays. I know how to write things alphabetically so that I can swap the disks because I, only, I didn't have enough disk drives to put the data on. I've been through this journey. Um, and it's, it's, you know, IT has been, an, it's, it's extraordinary. Personally, I think we are at a very pivotal moment for IT now. I think there's been a lot of continuous innovation, some of which has been very, very exciting. But it feels to me now, and looking at the behaviour of the businesses I work with, my people and my children, I think there's a new generation happening right now. So I think it is very exciting. And I think the role of um, education in promoting IT in a different way, not just at university level, but from <coughs> primary school onwards, is absolutely critical. Sophia was born well into my career, um, and actually it would have been quite useful if it had been there earlier, but hey-ho. Um, going back to the example of, you know, I started as a COBOL coder. Um, where am I now? I'm in quite a strange place, actually, because um, I, I do a lot of different things in my role. Um, it would have been nice to have thought about it a little bit and seen those options. 
um, as opposed to sort of just seeing what the next interesting challenge was. Do I regret it? Not a bit, but that's, that's not for everybody. Um, my own workplace learning has been very diverse. You know, I started off um, with some very traditional classroom style learning. Um, I did some group learning, for, especially for the softer skills stuff. My personal learning style I have learned over the years is I like learning on the job. Um, what have we learned? Um, lots of things, most of which actually have been talked about already today. Um, the most important learning, though, is sharing learning. Sharing, making it a community activity that is fun is really, really important. We've pushed really hard in our own group as part of taking the pain of that change journey out the joy of learning. We want to make it fun again. When I started way back in IT in those you know, early, early days, it was fun. It was sexy. Um, learning in the workplace, I feel, has kind of drifted into being um, more about measurement of results and a little less about just the fun of doing it. And I think that motivation will help people learn a lot better coupled with all those measurement techniques, if we can just make it fun again. And we wanted to make it fun so that it wasn't a threat. And that's how people feel when they're on a change journey. It's a threat. I haven't got that skill. My God, I've got to go and do this learning. What happens if I fail? Turn it on its head and you'll, take, you'll have a high-performing workforce. Our next generation of government IT professionals... Um, Again, as I said to my, my grads, or as we call them, Tibbers, uh, on Monday, the measure of my success in taking them through this journey is that I'll be working for them by the time I retire. But they will be different. Um, they will work in a world where breadth of skills matters, and it is recognised, and it, they will be recognised as professionals. Um, in everything they do. I think it's going to be a very, very exciting time. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, all I will say is thank you very much for listening, and I'm really looking forward to sharing your ideas. Thank you. I know I said be, be prompt, and <laughs> that's just great. We're actually 15 minutes ahead, so we've lots of time for questions. At the front, please. Just when you two went that way. <laughs> Typical, right in the middle. Hi, yeah, it's a question for, for you, Susan. Um, just saying to Andy, are there any simulators or models of the IT function itself? So when you were talking about how do people get that exposure, yeah. if I do an MBA, I run a model okay. for it. I'm just thinking if I had the service delivery service management model where I can throw in there's a network outage or there's a, something that's fallen over, would that go part of the way towards getting what you are, wanted? I mean, obviously there are some. So, um, sim I, can you hear me? Simulation and things that we could do um, within that environment. And um, we do use industry standard uh, databases, industri industry standard servers, so we can actually replicate. And we work for industry. That's another thing. So the, model, you know, the models that we use are what the industry are using. So we t send people into industry, and they, they do project work in their third year, which they then have to present to the client. And the client then has to accept their work, and then they can finish the job. And the other thing we do is entrepreneurship, so that some of our um, people start their own businesses whilst they're with us, and then they meet the learning outcomes very well. But, that, you know, but there's no sort of model model, but there are ways of getting around it. And we're being very inventive, making it fun. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I'd agree that most of the graduate jobs are at level two and level three, and, and we know that from seeing what our graduates do. But equally, our learning outcomes have to be at level four, five, six mm -hmm. at universities, especially at master's level. And now what actually happens is that student produces that level of performance once to pass an assessment. It's not the same as being able to repeat it sustainably. Mm. And the graduate recruiters we talk to 
want those level two, three skills, but they want them finely polished. Mm -hmm. But that's the stuff we taught them at first year in Scotland, A-level in England. Mm -hmm. So do we see a message that we can give to 16-year-olds so that they can plan the next 10 years of their career to become chartered IT professionals, which is about your first graduate job isn't going to be at this highfalutin <laughs> level. Yes. But it's going to be about you being a really good programmer or whatever specialism you yeah, go there, into. There is, a, there is a definitely a fine line, isn't there, between uh, raising their expectations because of giving them a skill that they believe they can walk into an industry job. But the, the whole curriculum is not just about the skills. So we've obviously got the transferable skills of IT capability and uh, group work and those sort of things. Then we've got the curriculum itself, which we have various other things within there that we have to learn in outcomes we have to meet that are not necessarily skills ones. So it's a balance, and it is, and it is producing the graduates that know in, enough to hit the ground running, but that realise... I mean, I, I had to say to a lot of people, you realise that when you go into your first job, you may not be employing any of these skills, but we do, we do try and hone the skills. We do give them as much um, professional... Um, rigour as we can within that environment. It is limited. Budgets are limited, but, you know, we, we do apply them. But it is a mixture of things. It's three different things. It's not just about the skills. So we, we try and give them the balance. Thank you. Any other questions? Down here, Paul, please. Leslie Machen, VZ Europe. Um, isn't what you're talking about rather a, a question of the differentiation between knowledge and competence? Um, and this is brought out very clearly when we look at the apprentice um, yes. qualifications, for example. And so what you're really looking to do, perhaps as, a, as part of a, a graduate course, is to give them a higher level of knowledge, mm -hmm. um, but then the competence levels that you're expecting them to achieve really are going to be at, at um, Sophia levels one, one two, and three. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and if you can um, make sure that they understand that differentiation, um, then then you're not falsely raising expectations. So you would expect their knowledge to be probably ahead of their competence. Mm, yes, indeed. Yeah, you're right. Any other? At the back there, please, Paul. Hi, um, this is thing for Jan. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's not a question. It's more sort of a viewpoint, um, you know, from um, the government. You know, there are lots of good things happening at MOJ, Ministry of Justice in ICT, in terms of leveraging CIFIA in all sort of ways. I mean, in your experience, what is happening in the similar situation at other executive agencies or governments at, or at the local councils? Any sort of view? Um, there are <coughs> pockets of really good stuff happening all over the place. Uh, one of the things that the newly reformed IT profession board is doing is trying to pull that together and get some momentum in driving it through. So, for example, I'm at a meeting tomorrow with Ron, uh, with the MOD, uh, DWP, um, half a dozen other agencies, some local authority type people, talking about career paths and accreditation. So it's starting to gather momentum. We've also, although the, the ICT strategy officially is for central government, we've recognised that that's not helpful. So for the capability strategy, we've deliberately included um, agencies, um, fire and rescue, for example, um, and health and some of the smaller organisations to try and make sure that everything we do is as applicable and usable at that level and that we can drive more exchange of people and ideas and competency across the whole piece. Your key point, though, is we're not getting these good news stories out there. <laughs> and on that very point, I can tell you that very, very soon there will be a new IT profession website for government coming out um, completely revamped, much more open, much more accessible, and we absolutely want to get these messages out there and encourage more community action. So, jam tomorrow, I'm afraid, but it's, it is definitely tomorrow and not a year away. Thank you. See that gentleman over there, please? 
Uh, Mike Chad. Mike. I was interested in hearing uh, Susan's comments about uh, pushing for more level ones and level twos and, and so forth in the context of, of what graduates are, are learning about. And, and some of the following comments sort of made me feel that there's um, a context here of, of graduates working very hard and being um, taught in universities and suddenly being lobbed over the wall into a job and uh, finding it's a rather different environment. Uh, I'm interested in, in hearing from either Susan or Kevin, or both, um, about what sort of level of integration is going on at the moment, and how, how you see the possibility of what we used to call sandwich courses, or, or um, a sort of shared uh, learning environment from the academic and uh, gradually phasing into the, the business world. Yeah, um, I mean... Personally, because obviously we work in a different context, but we, have, we very much encourage the placement year now. Um, so it is really back to the old sandwich. And we find that the graduates that do the placement year are more likely to get a first and more likely to be employed by the person that they've been working with. And so we've gone back to old values in many, many ways. Um, but um, even for the distance learners, a lot of those are already in work, like they are at the OU. And so they are just reapplying and realigning their skills um, so that they can move up the ladder. A lot of the people, especially in IT, have never had a proper master's level qualification. And the way that companies run now, you can't go up the ladder unless you've got it. So we've almost offered them a lifeline by saying, OK, you only did an H&D, H&C when you first started out. You've been in the IT department 15 years. You're truly skillful, but... It doesn't matter how many skills you've got, we're going to only recruit into this new position if you've got a master's or equivalent. And so, you know, we've bridged that gap as well. So we, we're, it's a two-pronged attack, really. And uh, we're trying to... And, and as I say, we're embedding lots of things within the classroom which are very much industry-orientated. And our own, our own VC is very much into entrepreneurship. So we're working with an agency at the moment, that is employing prisoners. I mean, it's, the business model is absolutely fantastic because he's a man who's got no children of his own. He, he, he won't be passing on his legacy. So he's using the business, the, the profit from his business, and he's actually getting prisoners in to learn a skill, and we're educating them as well. So we're educating in prisons. The prisoners are coming into the work environment. This man is putting everything into it, and so he's got, you know, he, he's got the satisfaction of giving people jobs, and these people then, prisoners, can go back into the workforce. Mm. Uh, and, and that's absolutely remarkable, and we're just supporting them as a, as, um, a university, and, and I think we've put 25% into that industry. So it, universities are changing in the mm. fact that they are very much more focused on employability and giving the right mm. skills. Um, I think I just want to add to that as well that, yes, distance learning does lend itself to developing competence that can be measured, that can be aligned. You can see how people are gaining that experience. Um, the area that's been more important for, for us as well is the whole work-based learning that came out of the, the foundation degree concept, where 50% of the study is work-based. So you then end up with modules like career development and employability. Um, as a core part of what students are studying uh, in the workplace, they're immediately learning around about how to put the skills into practice. Um, and you start to see people that are de developing real competence in the workplace um, through academic programmes. So I think that coupled with distance learning as an approach, um, we're really developing people now that have got usable, practical application of skills. One of the things we've just introduced, we're just piloting it this year for the first time. Um, government's always done um, summer internships for its general graduates. This year we're doing some for IT um, because it's a really good taster um, it's, and doing it as an internship end of year two is a great time for those that are doing more um, not work-based uh, learning to get a taste of what it's like. Mm. Um, so I, I, I would certainly promote that and, you know. Thank you. So we, we do have two more questions and we're running out of time, unless there's anything particularly. Um, so Sergio in the middle there, please. And then Paul in the middle. Thank you. Good morning to all. 
this question is for Andy. Okay. Uh, we, are, we are among uh, IT people talking about uh, IT skills framework. Um, my background and my organization has 300 plus employees. Uh, we are out, uh, IT outsourcers, so those people are our front office. So we need to, care, need to take care of their skills and competences uh, to perpetuate our business. My question is, a thing where I've been seeing uh, seen, uh, up to, to, to this point in the, the presentations that is quite in line what we have done during the past four years. So uh, I'm glad that we took the right path. <laughs> um, the other side of the coin is that uh, we really need to not start from the scratch each time uh, we have a new customer or we have a new employee. And my question specifically is, uh, what is the current state of the art in terms of <coughs> applications to manage all this information, uh, meaning creating a profile, mm -hmm. addressing the proficiency levels, mm -hmm. addressing the IT needs in terms of training and certifications, building up with the behavioral needs, mm -hmm. and then make the assessments to each one of the employees, establish the gaps, and define the action plans. Okay. okay. Do now, this answer, with please, Excel. <laughs> <It's very good. laughs> but I, I really uh, need to understand if there is any platform uh, that could help not only my organization but mm. some of the present years as, as well to support and to turn more efficient the management of all these uh, exercises. Thank all you. Right. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, from, from, my, from my own activity, yes, we do address these things on a bespoke basis and we assess every you know, situation separately, so it's exactly as you just described. But there are platforms available. I think the shortest answer I can do in a, a great act of generosity here is to, to recommend the BCS, the Sophia Plus platform, as a first port of call where there are template job profiles with classic mixes of Sophia skills and behavioural competencies to support them. Um, the the OU and uh, as picked up as as uh, Kevin was explaining on the, from the cabinet office uh, government IT profession standards to actually define template job roles and the and the skills that make those up. Uh, so there are there are some around, um, but uh, uh, yes, I mean yours is a specific example where from an industry point of view you don't want to have to reassess every situation afresh each time. Um, but I would, I would certainly look to the BCS initially for a platform to support what you've just described. Thank you very much.